Is it really true that there are more bacteria on farms than in an urban setting? So they looked at an urban apartment, compared it to farm, and it turned out that actually bacterial levels were very similar. So what gives? The difference was on the farm, there was far more bacterial diversity. And that was tremendously different. So while there were just maybe a few major strains in the urban environment, on a farm it was many, many, many more. And remember what I said about the immune system being very social. So what that turned into was we need bacterial diversity. And what you mentioned about the Amazon study is that in, there have been some studies looking at the stool of indigenous people who are not exposed to uh, the Roundup. They're not exposed to other pesticides and they're not getting antibiotics and they're being born vaginally and getting exposed to obviously dirt and soil and natural foods that they're they're eating in the jungle. And their stool had more bacterial diversity than any other documented stool sample. Hey folks, welcome back to High Intensity Health Radio. It's your host, Mike Mutzel, and I'm super excited to have Dr. Maya Satrit Klein with us today. She's the author of a wonderful book that I've been diving into over the weekend called The Dirt Cure, Growing Healthy Kids with Food Straight from the Soil. I think you guys are going to dig this, but I want to let you know a little bit about Dr. Maya Satrit Klein. She's a board-certified pediatric neurologist from Albert uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and she has a busy practice in the Bronx, New York. So Dr. Maya, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. So I'm super excited about your book. There's so much stuff I, that we're going to dive into. But let's kind of take, give us a little bit of context on the landscape of children's health as they are now as you see children compared to maybe when you were a you know, resident and, in, in, you know, in your early parts of training, like talk to us about the rise of chronic disease. Yeah, I, I definitely have noticed a huge difference, um, especially I think even starting from medical school, because I've been interested in pediatrics and pediatric neurology in particular since I was a medical student. And I was actually at that time doing research in autism um, with Dr. Isabel Rappin, who's, you know, kind of one of the mothers of pediatric neurology. Um, and, and, Already at that point, we were seeing a real increase in autism, and it was not anything like what it is now um, at that time. And, you know, uh, things like food allergies also, something that we saw a lot less of. I mean, and I think people know that even just from looking at their own, their own childhood. I don't know about you. I mean, I, you know, was brought up in the 70s, and if there was one kid in the class that had a food allergy, that was, like, really weird. Mm. And now there are classrooms that are nut-free, um, peanut-free. I mean, there are tables for kids with food allergies in the cafeteria. Like, a lot, you know, everyone has their food allergy issues, and it's a very meticulous problem for many schools. And so, you know, and we know that actually the the um, rate of peanut allergy has quadrupled in a little over a decade. Um, these are all documented in the literature. Uh, ADHD, learning disabilities, and some of these things we could say we have better detection. And to some degree, I think it's true. But there are actually studies that have been done, even on autism, you know, which has been a real controversy. Is this increase real? Is it just increased detection? And um, first of all, if it was really just increased detection, there'd be a whole generation of people with autism, of adults with autism right now, um, that are severe enough to be in, you know, group homes and um, that would be, you know, needing the kind of care that, I mean, we would be able to really see the numbers. And the truth of the matter is, there are adults with autism, but not nearly comparable to the number of um, children with mm -hmm. autism right now. So um, what the studies are telling us is this is not just a um, increased detection. It's also a real increase. Let's talk about, I want people to kind of make this connection because a lot of folks think that the brain is kind of, and you t I love how you talk about this in your book, it's like the top of the totem pole. You know, the brain is up there and it's isolated from the body and and things that happen to the brain are either you know genetic or innate. But, you know, you have a quote from your friend that says, I didn't go to to you know, study neurology to to look at the gut and all this sort of stuff. So talk to us about the, how neurology is really changing, and then how we can connect that back to our diet and the microbes. Well, the the sort of treasured uh, 
and and um, long-standing approach to the brain is that the central nervous system is kind of this inner sanctum and that nothing can really penetrate that inner sanctum ex unless the person's incredibly, incredibly sick. And we're learning actually that's not the case. We're learning the brain has its own immune system and that immune system is connected to the rest of the immune system. The brain has obviously, and the nervous system, there's a central nervous system and there's a peripheral nervous system, which is outside of the brain. And then there's an enteric nervous system, which is the nervous system of the digestive tract or the gut. And that, and actually it turns out that the digestive tract um, produces so many more neurotransmitters than the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's how powerfully it's involved in regulating um, our, our, our general nervous system. Um, and, it, and we also have a lot of neurons in our gut, enteric neurons, which are influenced by everything that's going on there. So if you have inflammation in your gut um, because of food or because of certain kinds of microbes or because of toxins, that influences the enteric nervous system and the enteric nervous system um, communicates with the central nervous system and we feel it in our brain. And now we have all this data that's growing and growing and growing that's telling us that what happens in the gut is impacting our mood, our cognition, so how well we think about things, our memory, um, our anxiety, our stress levels, our sleep. So everything that we care about is actually in part regulated by what's happening in our digestive tract. And it's modulated in part by our immune system as well. Um, yeah. So it's very complex. Very complex. Yeah, I want to dive into the details of that. And I think it's pretty alarming also to some of the studies that you highlight in your book, one of which you talked about how a clinical study, I think in 2011, where uh, researchers gave animals antibiotics and they sterilized the gut and they noticed that the animals were no longer able to uh, conduct uh, neuroplasticity and the learning and memory and cognition went down by sterilizing the gut and that's powerful and that ties into the widespread use of antibiotics and you highlight uh, you know, kind of a some dialogue between a child's pediatrician that had ADHD and the pediatrician said, no, the antibiotics are not connected to uh, the ADHD there, or they're, sorry, the ear infection associated antibiotics are not connected to ADHD. And, mm -hmm. and so I thought that was really profound. So talk to us about how the, the, the gut microbes are doing things and how the use of antibiotics is affecting the brain. Well, our, our immune system is very influenced by what's happening in our digestive tract. Our immune system, you know, we think of it as patrolling and looking for enemies and kind of wanting to wage warfare. But really, our immune system is a very social entity. It really wants to meet and greet. And it just, it's looking, yes, it's looking for things that could be dangerous, but it's also just looking to, um, to socialize with a lot of different organisms, a lot of different things, food. And I mean, think about it. The digestive tract is open on both ends, right? In the mouth and the other end. And it's really outside of the body. It's both outside the body and inside the body. But really, um, there's kind of anything can get in that you let get into your mouth. And we don't always know exactly what's getting in there. So the immune system is kind of checking all these things out and and wants that needs that stimulation it's an information processing center as well when the immune system is not getting the the kind of social interaction that it needs um, it starts to get a little bit paranoid and what ends up happening is it might react against things that are not actually problematic it's like it starts to think that things that aren't really enemies could be enemies like milk protein or like, you know, a certain kind of organism that's not necessarily a problem, but you know, it, the immune system starts to think it is and it reacts. And what the immune system then does is it starts to release a lot of different uh, chemicals called cytokines. And I kind of talk about that as, I mean, I think of it almost as like a walkie talkie that they're kind of telling the immune cells all over the body, we might have a problem here. Mm. Well, you know, that can activate things um, in the skin. So you could see eczema. You can see it in the lungs, like asthma. You can see it, obviously, in the gut, um, which can look like, you know, colitis. It can look like um, even just um, irritable bowel syndrome or constipation or diarrhea or reflux, you know, heartburn, all those kinds of things. But um, we also have 
immune cells in the brain uh, called microglia. And they're not just immune cells, they're, they're nurse cells in a sense, and in a three to one ratio with neurons. So there are far more microglia in our brain actually than neurons. And they're caring for the neurons, but they're also protecting the neurons. And when they get activated by those cytokines, right, that walkie-talkie message that, you know, crosses the blood-brain barrier into the inner sanctum, that's the central nervous system, those microglia activate. And then they kind of become like mama bear. And they want to protect their neurons. And so they actually become kind of into warrior mode and they can release inflam inflammatory factors. Um, and actually, it can be damaging to the neurons and it causes them to function suboptimally, you know, and that can look like all kinds of things. It can look like uh, issues with attention, like ADHD. It can look like um, seizures, right? Abnormal firing. Um, it can look like migraines. It can look like ticks, Tourette's, pandas. It has all of those different kinds of elements. There's not one way that an inflamed system um, or microglial activation, as we call it, will look. Clinically, it depends on the person. But all of these symptoms are actually related to what's going on in the immune system. Um, so that is an example of how what's happening in your digestive tract is affecting, I mean, it can be causing ear infections, it can be causing lots of different things. And that's why, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is looking at constellations of symptoms. You don't just look at each symptom as a separate entity, but you have to look at all of them together and connect them. And that is how we get to the root cause of the issue. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about your book is you're introducing a new paradigm. And so I think this is hard for Western medicine to kind of wrap their hands around this because they need, you know, these algorithms, if mm -hmm. this, then that, right? But you're you're saying, well, if this, then that, or X, Y, Z, or D, or whatever it may be, right? So you're introducing this new paradigm. So, you know, the science is clearly here. You reference all the studies in your book. Are your colleagues thinking more kind of functionally oriented when it comes to, you know, this neuroendocrine immune kind of wind up, or are they still stuck in the... The box of like as uh, you know Sid Baker as you highlight in his book, uh, tame it, blame it, and and so forth. What's the what's the paradigm here? Um, I think you know in neurology, I would say more than in many fields, um, they're very open to a lot of different causes. But I do think that the pharmaceutical model, um, and honestly the insurance model, because the insurance model means shorter visits. Nice. Um, and you know that's just a business issue. So for people who are sort of stuck in that, doctors who are stuck in that paradigm, they just don't have as much time to think and to get to know what's happening. Um, and and that's a handicap when you need to look at complex issues, which are the kind of issues that we're seeing now, these chronic health issues. Um, but in addition to that, I think the pharmaceutical paradigm has this sort of magic bullet approach, like, oh, this is your problem this is the drug. And, you know, this is how doctors are being trained now. So I even remember, and I, you know, as, as a young attending coming out of training, I was frustrated because everyone was telling me, oh, you know, in private practice, you're going to see tons of ADHD. That's all you're going to see. And all you have to do is just give stimulants. Well, I see kids, right? And so I'm going into private practice in a very well-to-do area, as it turned out, where, you know, people were used to kind of getting answers to their problems and the doctor solving the problem quickly. And they were coming with four and five-year-olds saying, you know, the teacher says he's having problems sitting in circle time and he's not, you know, paying attention the way he's supposed to. And they're saying it's ADHD and we want, you know, medication. And I'm thinking stimulants, I was trained that stimulants are drugs of abuse and are potentially, you know, problematic for the developing brain. And we do have data that they're that we should be concerned about that, especially long term. Because think about it. I mean, it's one thing to give an adult a stimulant, and we could talk about, you know, what the risks are there. But in children and their brains are developing, we don't have any idea what their brain's going to look like in 30 or 50 years. And some of these people really stay on their medication through a college, through career and, and into adulthood. And, you know, um, that's, we don't know what that's going to do to their brains. And there is some data um, that long-term use of 
stimulants may uh, lead to possible Parkinson's. Um, there was a huge study on that done actually um, Kaiser Permanente and presented uh, some years back at the American Academy of Neurology meeting. So we have concerns. I mean, we have to have concerns about that. And I think a lot of neurologists are really stuck in this, what medication do we use? And, and that's where it ends. Let's kind of transition a little bit um, into to ways that we can optimize this kind of walkie-talkie communication system between the gut, immune system, and then the brain. And maybe start off with the study that you talked about, how bacterial diversity is key to balancing the immune system. And you highlighted a study about folks in the Amazon rainforest. So maybe uh, talk about that and, and share with us why diversity is so important. Sure. Actually, the original part of that study starts with the hygiene hypothesis. Right, and I think most people have heard of that. With the hygiene hypothesis, we were we were seeing, you know, in these scientific studies that children who uh, grew up on farms were less likely to have asthma, allergies, and other kinds of allergic syndromes than children who lived in urban environments. So, of course, the first thing people thought were, well, farms are dirtier, and therefore, it must be that there's more more bacteria there. Right. It just makes sense. Like there's probably more bacteria and, you know, we need bacteria. So that was a great first step um, to kind of be able to think about it that way. So we thought, OK, the hygiene hypothesis, we're too clean and we need to be exposed to some bugs. But then some researchers came along and said, hey, I'm going to check this out. Is it really true that there are more bacteria on farms than in an urban setting? So they looked at an urban apartment, compared it to farm. And it turned out that actually bacterial levels were very similar. So what gives? Well, the difference was on the farm, there was far more bacterial diversity. And that was tremendously different. So while there were just maybe a few major strains in the urban environment, on a farm it was many, many, many more. And remember what I said about the immune system being very social. So what that turned into was we need bacterial diversity. And there's some data also now about um, people who have celiac, that when we increase their bacterial diversity in their gut, they actually become less sensitive and their symptoms come down. Um, so there's interesting, interesting data that's growing um, more and more. And what you mentioned about the Amazon study is that in there have been some studies looking at the stool of indigenous people who are not exposed to uh, the Roundup, they're not exposed to um, uh, other pesticides, and they're not getting antibiotics, and they're being born vaginally, um, you know, and, and getting exposed to obviously dirt and soil and natural foods that they're, they're eating in the jungle, and their stool had more bacterial diversity than any other documented stool sample. And they don't have these kinds of diseases, obviously. Right, and they're not being exposed to to the antibiotics and so forth. So, um, a practical question came to mind. You know, a lot of folks like you, you live in New York, right? In the major cities, a lot of people are washing their hands. You know, they get on, off the subway and they're scared of that. Like, is that bad? I mean, if I go on a farm and like dig around in cow manure. I'm probably less inclined to like scrub down and get my hands, you know, clean compared to like in a major city. So what are some practical tips, you know, for people listening right now who, yeah, they want to be clean, but they also want to get the good microbes. Like what can we do about this on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that we're getting these, this diverse array of microbes in, in, the, in the right amounts and so forth? I think that's a fantastic question. First of all, um, there's data that shows that uh, children who are in schools or homes where bleach is used regularly actually have 30% higher risk, 20 to 30% higher risk of developing chronic cough in the winter, flu, and other illnesses. So our desire to be clean and disinfect may actually, again, be paradoxically causing us more illness. Um, I think if you roll around in cow manure, probably should wash your hands <laughs> and other parts of you. Um, yeah. Because it's not to say that just, be, you know, we know that there are some benefits, obviously, but, you know, there, there's also some downsides to that. Right. But um, I think, you know, for one thing, I mean, we've gotten into this 
Better Living Through Chemistry model, where hand sanitizer and bleach, and you know, we want to like kind of antibiotic away everything. And that's, I think, where we're making mistakes because um, I'm, a f I'm fond of soap. I think we should use it on our hands. I think hand washing was actually probably the biggest, um, the biggest advance that we made in terms of preventing, you know, infectious disease. Um, or one of the biggest advances, and uh, it's a good idea. Regular soap, like a bar, not the chemical stuff, not hand sanitizer. And in fact, I actually carry around with me. Um, I, you know, if I happen to be in, you know, New York City, and you know, walking the streets there, I keep a little bit of essential oil with me in a little vial because um, actually, it turns out that essential oils have great benefit when it comes to um, dealing with dangerous bacteria, actually resistant bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, essential oils look like they're going to maybe be the next, uh, the next phase, you know, what we're going to be doing when antibiotics kind of go the way of, uh, you know, leeches and other things, because basically, you know, well, basically, because um, we're becoming, I mean, we're become, we're, we're getting bacteria that are resistant to all antibiotics, and that's happening. It's happening um, slowly but surely. And, uh, you know, at some point we're going to have to face that. So I actually think um, the way to kind of immerse yourself, though, is to be in natural settings. I mean, even if you're in a city, there are parks, there are um, environments where, you know, community gardens, places to get your hands dirty. If you can go, you know, on a weekend or, you know, something like that, go just be in nature. Um, Soil is actually one teaspoon of soil has as many organisms in it as there are people on earth. Wow, that's incredible. So along those lines, we talked about hand washing. Should people wash their vegetables if they're organic? What do you offer for families and folks listening? I think um, what we want is, uh, and this is another, another important thing that we can all do, is eating um, fresh food from soil uh, you know, that's in the title, but I mean it literally that, you know, we do want to get, go to farmer's markets, go to CSAs, you know, if you're in an urban environment, for sure, if you live in a suburban area, you know, food, not lawns, use your garden, use your lawn as a, as a place to grow, um, to grow food, to grow other things. But yes, I do think we should wash our vegetables. I don't think power washing and waxing and the kind of things that when you go to the grocery store are done. Are a great idea but I think washing um, you know doing a good washing even with a brush you will still get traces of the bacteria and the soil um, you know there are you know manure for instance can be used on food and we don't want to get we don't want to get ill uh, we want to get well so I do think washing is a good idea but I will tell you in my own garden where I know what's in it um, and I know what's been used on it and I'm not using, you know, manure in that way. If I pull a carrot out, you know, I rub it on my jeans and, you know, I might eat it. I mean, or at least if I rinse it with the hose quickly, I'm not scrubbing and I'm not going crazy. And certainly anything that's not underground, we pick it and we eat it. Love it. Yeah, you have a great garden. I saw that when we filmed your autism intensive interview, and that was really awesome. So um, let's go back a little bit to the medications, because I think this is really important for, for parents to know about. You talked about, you know, Tylenol use, and, you know, we talked about antibiotics, like the germ theory. Germs are bad, and so the, the thinking process for a long time, we've made this mistake, is we just want to wipe them out. We realize, oops, that's a bad thing, but you talk about the the immune the innate immune response and, and antipyretics and how that actually does has some long-term effects there. So parents listening and kids are running a fever, like, like give us your breakdown as a neurologist. Where do we draw the line between, okay, we need to you know, take medicines or let it run its course? Right. If you have an infant, a newborn, you know, under two months of age, this is a whole different story, okay? So let's set that aside because if you have an, an infant, they can have other infections, et cetera, you know, you talk to your pediatrician. Um, and you always have them checked out. But if you have, you know, an older baby, six months, or a two-year-old, or a five-year-old, or an eight-year-old, um, fevers are actually important. Um, first of all, occasionally getting sick is important for the immune system. And I know a lot of people, they hear fever and they think um, they're terrified. I mean, they think bad. This is a bad thing. 
And I actually kind of appreciate, you know, when my kids get a fever, um, you can look at your kid and usually have a sense. Are they just kind of sick and poopy and feeling not great? Or are they toxic? Do they look toxic? You know, and your spidey senses kind of go up when your kid looks toxic. And that's, again, a fever can be a sign of severe illness. It's possible, but it's usually not the case. So if your spidey senses aren't up, if you're not, ah, you know, a fever just by itself can be um, important. It's the body learning what to do when there's an organism and how to vanquish that organism, how to bring the body back into balance. And it's part of the immune response. So I allow my children to have fevers and I recommend that my patients do um, in most cases. And I don't give them Tylenol. I don't give them Advil. Um, if the fever is 104 or over, that's a different story. I will sometimes do it then. But under 104, and this is actually the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, does, you know, says under 104, you do not need to treat, mm. you know, assuming it's not, again, a toxic situation. Um, I give them cool compresses. I actually use a little bit of uh, peppermint essential oil in cold water, and then I douse a little compress in it because peppermint's very cooling and it's very soothing. Um, so we do that. We might give them a warm bath, not cold, not too cold, because when you're hot, <laughs> that feels freezing and it's not good. Um, and I try to help them sweat. So if I feel like the fever is getting higher or they're really uncomfortable, um, I will use uh, sometimes yarrow, um, yarrow tea or uh, yarrow tincture in a small amount. And um, yarrow helps you sweat. So sweating without changing the immune response and all the other inflammatory elements that are happening that the immune system needs in order to learn to, you know, vanquish illness and get the body into balance. We're just helping sweat to kind of bring down the, um, the temperature so that, you know, the child's a little bit more comfortable. Really practical tips there. And let's uh, offer that a similar uh, set of practical tips for ADHD and ADD. And, and you talked about food a little bit and that a whole neuroimmune wind up. Um, where do people start? Because like you said, I mean, there there's a lot of push towards medicines, but as you mentioned, we now know that long term that that's not the real solution. So where do you start with, with folks that have children that really, you know, they're getting pushed to be put on ADHD and ADD type meds? Well, there, you know, ADD and ADHD um, are a really interesting entity. I mean, I think it's clear there are some people who are definitely suffering from hyperactivity or um, poor focus or poor memory or the, the constellation of symptoms that fall under this category of ADD and ADHD. Um, there are also a lot of people who are, you know, I have kids who are anxious um, and really anxious. And so they're having a really hard time in the classroom and they're not hearing things that are going on and they're acting out, but really it has to do with their anxiety. It could have to do with their, um, dynamic with the teacher or with other kids in the classroom. Um, they might have sometimes some learning disability and they're acting out or they're, you know, kind of clowning around or being disruptive or whatever it may be because, you know, they're not able to read well, or they're not understanding. They have an auditory processing issue and they don't really understand what's being said in the classroom. So I do think it's really important um, to look at those kinds of things. But also I see a lot of kids who are eating sugar cereal or a breakfast bar in the morning, and then they're having real trouble in the classroom. They're not able to focus. They're kind of woozy. They're out of it or whatever, or they're having meltdowns because they're having a huge blood sugar crash, you know, in the middle of the morning. So they're more, I always ask what time of day there's a problem. If it's right after lunch, if it's right after breakfast, you know, sometimes you can figure out it has to do with their diet you know, or if they're not sleeping well. I mean, these are, I just think it's really important when you're looking at ADHD to be thinking, not thinking this is a di brain disease. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a brain disease. And it's certainly not necessarily, although there are aspects of it, you know, that can be genetic and you can definitely see in your child the kind of trials and tribulations you yourself might have struggled with. So for sure there are some genetic and what we call epigenetic um, elements. There are things that are passed down um, in various ways. There are also a lot of environmental things. 
um, because there's no test for ADD or ADHD. You know, there's no biological test. So putting that aside, I would say um, we have a lot of data about number one chemicals. So um, I would say for one thing, just cleaning up the diet. Um, and I talk about this in a lot of detail in my book, kind of food chemicals, looking at things like MSG and, you know, artificial sweeteners, um, sugar, high fructose corn syrup. Um, I definitely see children, if they have sugar in a large amount or maybe not even in a large amount, processed sugar, they're like different people. They're like the Hulk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> after having sugar. And, and it can be a perfectly mild-mannered, very sweet kid. And I watch it happen in my office because sometimes kids come, say, after school, and a parent will bring a snack, and I can watch, you know, the child being, like, nice and pleasant, and then they eat something, and you watch the transformation. And it can be five, ten minutes. You're like, whoa, you know, I have a crazy person sitting in my office now. Um, that can be a sugar issue. Uh, also, food dyes and preservatives. There are big studies that have been done that were uh, really well done, randomized, double blind, you know, controlled all the important things that we look for in a good clinical trial that showed that children um, two and three years old and eight years old um, in this particular trial had increased hyperactivity, whether or not they had ADHD when they had a combination of food dyes and preservatives commonly, commonly found in foods that children are eating. So food chemicals, number one, clean up the diet. Clean up the diet, um, that's the first thing. And then food reactivity is another one, and we have data about that as well. Um, and obviously not everyone can eat all organic, but there are also studies looking at children with uh, organophosphate pesticide metabolites in their urine. So they're eating conventionally grown food, they have higher levels of those kinds of organophosphate pesticide metabolites in their urine. You put kids, uh, and you find that those children actually have higher rates of ADHD. Um, then when they take those children and put them on organic diets um, for three to five days, those levels drop. The levels of those organic phosphate pesticides drop. So there's a lot of different ways that we can really reach children without necessarily having to medicate them. I think medication in most cases is really like a last option um, after a lot of other things have been tried. And there's many other things. I mean, I use botanicals, I use other things, but this is foundational. This is foundational. Yeah, yeah really great practical tips there. Um, I think your volume was all having some feedback there. Hmm. If you turn it down, did you hear that or was that just me? I you turned down just a touch, like one or two, so I'm still audible. Um, wow, great information there, Dr. Maya. Now let's finish off here with some other aspects of the diet because there's a lot of controversy on, on the internet now, like low FODMAP and then you know a lot of the gut microbiome folks are saying, well, no, you need to eat more fiber. That's beneficial. So where do, where do you stand on this fiber issue? Because we know it's good, but not in some people. Any uh, you know kind of lessons learned over your career as a functional neurologist? I think that um, best, let me just stop a second. Do you want me to turn it down more? Are you still hearing the feedback? Maybe one more. I don't think I heard it, but. Okay. okay. So what I find in, in generally speaking, um, children who are healthy should be getting whole foods, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, um, you know, best whole grains if they're having grains, um, and, you know, pastured meat, plenty of fat, um, you know, pastured eggs, and so on. Okay, so that I think is the standard um, for most people, and most especially children. People who have damaged guts um, and their digestive tract is not working well, sometimes are suffering severe symptoms. And sometimes that can be due to food allergy. So sometimes we deal with food allergy. Sometimes that can be due to problems with digesting grains. So in those children, we might look at a specific carbohydrate diet. Um, sometimes it can be related to having uh, dysbiosis, very severe um, disruption in the microbiome. In those cases, in kids who have a lot of bloating, a lot of gas, pain, okay, real stomach pain, um, and I've tried a few other things. 
Sometimes we'll do a low FODMAPs diet and I can see amazing results. It's quite possible to see amazing results. Um, but I don't think that means that people should avoid fiber. I think I don't tell people go on wheat bran, you know, I mean, ever. <laughs> but I think most people actually, um, most children in particular, do very well with all kinds of different whole foods. And that's really what we want their body to accommodate. We don't want to live in this weird world of like, you can't have this, you can't have that, you can't have, you know, um, particularly when it comes to fruit and vegetables. So I, I reserve the FODMAPs diet for um, kind of refractory people who have had a lot of struggle. When it works, it's fantastic. But I don't see that as a way of life either, I would just say. My goal then is to help heal their gut, heal their microbiome, so that these kids are going to be able to eat those foods again. I mean, I think we should all want to eat, you know, a, an array of beautiful fruits and vegetables and other foods. Very practical. I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And one of the compounds or components of foods is their immune system, the phytonutrients that you speak about in the book. So talk to us about that and why they're so good for us. Well, I love talking about phytonutrients <laughs> because, um, you know, I think of plants as actually being, um, I mean, they're living, to me, they're living beings and we have a relationship with them. Plants are not just healthy for us because that's their role in the world. I mean, plants have their own, their own, you know, activities and their own um, desires in a sense. I mean, right? They're they're trying to survive uh, at at a minimum, and so one of the things that actually causes uh, plants to produce phytonutrients is stressors. Um, it makes plants more resilient. So if you think about like a sun-kissed apple, right? the most beautiful bright red apples are growing at the top of the tree. Why? Because of UV um, radiation. And the UV radiation stimulates the, the immune system because UV radiation can damage, right? It can damage tissue. So um, they actually upregulate their phytonutrient uh, production. That also happens in the soil when there are pests right? Different kinds of pests, right? And so this is when we're talking about growing organically versus growing with pesticides. Those pests and those microbes stress the plants in various ways that cause them, again, to upregulate their phytonutrient production. Well, what are phytonutrients? They're what make cranberries red, you know? They're what make lemons, um, you know, have that fantastic odor. They're what make coffee bitter. Um, you know, those, those are the phytonutrients that we crave um, and that our bodies crave and that communicate with us on a, on a, you know, body level, um, all the way down to our cells, all the way down to our DNA, we're interacting with those phytonutrients and, and they're what make food delicious to us. Um, plus they're great for our bodies. So, uh, phytonutrients are, are amazing and they require actually the plants to respond, um, to their environment. And then they, in turn, make our bodies respond to our environment. It's a win-win, and, and you talk about in the book how the phytonutrients also help with the gut microbiome, which is so important, so that's really interesting. So I love this conversation, Dr. Maya. Now there's one last question that I have to ask about uh, in kind of the future and where things are at, and that's fecal microbiota transplantation. Uh, where do you see that going? Are you using it in your clinical practice? Um, and, and also helminth therapy, using parasites in a therapeutic way. Are those two therapies part of your you know, clinical armamentarium at this point, or are they on the horizon? Like, share, share with us your perspective. Both of these are really interesting. So for those who don't know, fecal microbial transplant are um, actually having stool from another, from a donor, um, being transplanted um, by enema and sometimes also by capsules into another person who's ill. Um, and uh, this is being done actually in major medical centers right now in certain cases for things like uh, intractable, um, untreatable clostridium difficile infection is kind of the main one it's being used for, although there are some other reasons as well. Um, and it can be incredibly helpful. Um, I know there are people using it for autism and um, in a lot of other uh, digestive tract issues. And I think um, I think it's impressive, and I think there's something to be learned from this, which is that um, when we try to man do the man-made probiotic thing, we're never going to be able to approximate what stool is like. 
we're never going to be able to approximate what soil is like. Um, we need to we need to uh, again like create alliances with the natural world to achieve that kind of biodiversity um, in our bodies again. Um, and I'm going to just talk about the the parasite. Uh, therapy, also the Hellman therapy, and then I'll tell you what I think about using them in my practice. So the Hellman therapy, um, which is also being used and investigated quite a bit for autoimmune disease, for autism, and for, you know, even allergy, um, is giving generally deactivated um, uh, worms, right, parasitic worms, helminths, um, either their eggs or some other component into the body so that they are um, basically stimulating the immune system to look away from self, from attacking self, and kind of redirecting to, uh, you know, paying attention to other, you know. And, and it's a fabulous idea. There's been a lot of um, really promising, I think, early results. Um, and I would say for both of them, um, I've had some patients who have, who have done it, um, and some of them have had uh, really good results. And some of them, I think, have had, like, we've had some questions about it. Um, and I think, all in all, I really like looking at how it's developing. I tend to be more cautious in my practice. Um, I, I believe in the do-no-harm approach. So, and I like to have, I like to have the f as full an idea of what, um, what happens both in the short and long term um, before I really start prescribing these kinds of things. But I do think fecal microbial transplant um, is really, really promising and I'm excited about it. Um, and I think, you know, the, the main problem with it is who's the stool donor? Because um, that's honestly, you know, you want you want someone who hasn't gotten antibiotics. You want someone who ideally was born vaginally and was breastfed. And I mean, things that, you know, impact the, the gut and the immune system in a long-term way um, and who's been outside and who's been exposed to biodiversity. So we're in a little bit of a pickle, right? Because we don't have so many people like that anymore. Um, so I think like, you know, there's a part of me that feels like these treatments are not quite ready for prime time. Um, and I, and I want to understand more about how to do it the right way before I kind of say, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's do it for everyone. Yeah. That's a, a great perspective. I really enjoy that, Dr. Maya. So, um, again, you're the author of the dirt cure, which comes out on January, January 26th. Gen oh, sorry, January 26th. So, so we're ahead of time. So by the time you're watching this, it will be available. You can also pre-order it on Amazon and we'll have some, some links there and also the show notes at highintensityhealth.com slash drmaya. So Dr. Maya, we have three final questions here that we ask every guest on the show. Now, the first one, we want to get to know you a little bit better. You're an integrative pediatric neurologist. You wrote this great book. What's your morning routine? Is there anything special or uh, insightful that we should know about some routine or practice that you do to start your day? Um, well, I always like to take a few minutes when I wake up to um, just have a few minutes of meditation and gratitude. I always start the day kind of setting an intention um, and just trying to be present and grounded uh, because I'm a mom of three kids and, uh, you know, practice and a lot of other things always going on. Um, and then I you know, have to make my kids lunch and, you know, get everybody fed. And so I keep chickens actually. And one of the parts of my morning routine is going out and gathering fresh eggs in the morning to, uh, to prepare for my children for breakfast. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have tea. I'm a big fan, as you will see in the book of, uh, of herbal teas and different kinds of teas. And, uh, so always doing that with a little bit of raw honey or, or not. And, um, you know, and uh, always trying to find a little way to get some apple cider vinegar also into my morning. Mm, love that. That's really awesome. That's fantastic. Now, if there was, let's transition a little bit here, one herb, nutrient, or botanical. You're going to be on a desert island, for example. Uh, vitamin D and omega-3s are covered. Okay, what else would you take with you that you just couldn't live without? You know, it's such a hard question because, uh, you know, I'm an herbalist also. So I, you know, as you heard, love plants. But... Um, off the top of my head on a desert island, I mean, I would want to have something that had uh, some good, I would probably, I think I'd probably bring along some uh, thieves oil. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, like a combination of essential oils that would be really good uh, as needed for, you know, infection um, and have, you know, some beautiful aromas and things like that. Or another option um, would be something relaxing like uh, wild milky oats, which is one of my favorite tinctures for just kind of chilling and being calm. Love that. No one's mentioned either of those. So that's that's an awesome way to end this. Now, final question here is if you're in an elevator with a, a United States president or someone from the World Health Organization and just had 30 seconds to bend their ear on a lifestyle or health tip that you feel that they should shout from the mountaintops about, you know, how to improve health of our children and the world, what would that tip be and why? I think we've become really disconnected from, um, you know, what, how the world around us shapes our health and our children's health. So I think I would talk about, um, you know, controlling toxic exposures and um, the importance of, of being custodians of soil and restoring natural environments and wild environments. Um, those are my two, I think, biggest issues is that we need to be exposed to more nature and we need to have healthy soil and we need to have uh, fewer toxic chemical exposures. Yeah, yeah, fabulous way to end this wonderful discussion. So, Dr. Maya, folks want to reach out to you, connect with you. I know you have a couple of different websites. What's the best resource where people can uh, follow your work? Um, they can come see my uh, website, www.dirtcure.com, um, which will have everything I'm doing, all the news about the book, classes I'm teaching, and uh, also in. Uh, mentorship program I'm starting called the Terrain Institute, where we're going to be learning about all these things together. Love that. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Didn't know about that. So we'll have folks listening. If you're uh, you know, walking your dog or you're at the gym or driving your car, we'll have all the show notes and links to Dr. Maya's book at highintensityhealth.com slash drmaya. So again, really love the book. I think everyone should go out there and check this out. Uh, whether you have kids or you don't, you're going to dig this information. So Dr. Maya, thanks again for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Hope you have an awesome day. Thank you so much for having me.